Hello, I'm continuing my reviews on the Nightmare on Elm Street series with A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Now, The Dream Master came out in 1988, and this is obviously the fourth film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Now, I already reviewed this movie along with all the other Nightmare on Elm Street films all the way back in 2011 for Season 1 of Horror Month. Those reviews are still up, however, they're no longer public, but you can still see them on the Horror Month Season 1 playlist, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. I also discussed this movie at length in a 2018 retrospective on the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise I recorded with some friends of mine, which I'll also leave a link to in the description below. However, I will also include some audio from that retrospective later on in this video. And I also recently re-reviewed the first three Nightmare on Elm Street movies, which you can check out on the playlist for Horror Month Season 12. Now, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 was directed by Rennie Harlan, who prior to this directed a movie called Prison, and he would go on to direct films like The Adventures of Ford Fairlin, Die Hard 2, Cutthroat Island, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Cliffhanger, Deep Blue Sea, and many others. And he was actually married to Gina Davis for a few years, although not at the time he did this movie. Now, the screenplay for this film was co-written by Brian Helgeland, who would go on to write films like L.A. Confidential and Mystic River. The screenplay was also co-written by Jim and Ken Wheat, who would go on to co-write The Fly 2, along with Frank Darabont and Mick Garris. Now, it should be noted that Renny Harlan went through hell to make this movie. Bob Shea had no faith in him whatsoever, and really kind of hated the guy. And Renny Harlan was desperate to get this job. At the time, he had no money, and apparently was showing up to the offices of New Line Cinema every day, wearing the same clothes, and was practically begging Robert Shea to give him the job as director. Now, despite all that, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 became a huge hit at the box office and was actually the highest grossing Nightmare on Elm Street film up until that point and remained the most commercially successful Nightmare film until 2003 when we got Freddy vs. Jason. And this really was sort of the commercialization of the franchise. And this really was the film that made Freddy Krueger a pop culture icon, even more so than the first three movies. Like, this is the one that really did inspire all the toys and merchandising. Around this time, you had the Nightmare on Elm Street TV series, Freddy's Nightmares, which I think most fans consider to be non-canon. And you had all the music video tie-ins, which granted did start with Dawkins' Dream Warriors. But for this movie, you had the Fat Boys song, Are You Ready for Freddy? Which actually featured Robert Englund as Freddy Krueger rapping with the Fat Boys. And there's a reason this one is considered to be the MTV Nightmare on Elm Street movie, because the film had the most dense soundtrack out of all the Nightmare films. And if you watch the movie... There's a lot of moments where it really does feel like a music video. Now, I'll admit, I did not really care for this one when I first saw it, but as time went on, this movie really has grown on me, and now I can honestly say that I love A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. I think the film has a lot of imagination, I think it's very well made, and I actually think it has really good characters, and really good characterization. Sure, the characters in the movie are kind of cliched, but there's still like Likeable. But I will say, this is also the film that kind of broke the franchise in terms of Freddy's scariness, because Freddy is not scary in this movie at all. Now, even though Freddy's dark humor started with Part 3, this is the first film in the series that I would call an outright horror comedy, but the film is actually very light on the horror. Like, sure, there are some horrific things in the movie, and there is some gore in the film, but the movie almost plays out as more of a fantasy action comedy with horror elements rather than a straight-out horror film. The movie also has elements of teen drama, now, Dream Master picks up where Dream Warriors left off. Now, in Dream Warriors, it was revealed that the people who killed Freddy when he was human hid his remains in an old junkyard, and it was suggested in that film that the reason Freddy's soul was able to wander the Dream World was because he was never properly laid to rest. 
So, at the end of that movie, the character of Neil Gordon buried Freddy's bones in hollowed ground and said a prayer, essentially giving Freddy a funeral, and then we saw in the dream world Freddy torn apart by the light of God, presumably destroying him once and for all, because keep in mind Dream Warriors was meant to be the final film in the franchise, but of course it wasn't, so in this movie they had to come up with some contrived way to bring Freddy back. So, what the plot of the Dream Master is we follow Kristen, Kincaid, and Joey, who are the last surviving children of the people who killed Freddy, and they have since been released from the psychiatric hospital and are trying to live relatively normal teenage lives. But Kristen is terrified that Freddy is going to come back, but Kincaid and Joey try to convince her that it's all over, that he's not coming back, but her fears prove to be correct. Freddy does come back from hell, and I guess this is a spoiler, but it happens right at the beginning of the film. Freddy ends up killing Kincaid and Joey, and ultimately comes for Kristen. Now, in the previous film, it was established that Kristen had the power to bring other people into the same dream as her, and Freddy ends up tricking her into bringing her friend Alice into her dream. Then Freddy kills her and takes her soul, but a part of her soul also goes into Alice, and Alice also inherits her powers. And because Freddy has now killed off all the children of the people who originally killed him, now the only way he can go after new victims is if he uses a conduit of sorts. So now he's using Alice's dreams, so every time Alice falls asleep, one of her friends falls asleep, and Freddy comes after them. And with every person that Freddy kills, he takes their souls, but a part of them also go into Alice. And Alice inherits some of their personality traits as well as their powers, because it's established in both this and the previous film that in this universe some people have special powers in the dream world, and Alice inherits these powers from her friends. And Alice is becoming the Dream Master. She's essentially becoming a vessel for some kind of a higher power, be that God or just some kind of benevolent force within the Dream World that counteracts whatever evil force controls Freddy. So now Alice must use her powers as the Dream Master to destroy Freddy and free the souls of his victims. Now in the film, Robert Englin, of course, reprises his role as Freddy Krueger, and he's good in the movie, but like I said, I would say this movie really was the beginning of the comedic Freddy. I mean, technically, the comedic Freddy started with Dream Warriors, but he was still relatively creepy in that one. Whereas in this movie, like I said before, Freddy is not scary at all. This is the beginning of the Freddy who would make the puns and the one-liners and the jokes whenever he would kill people. And unfortunately, this is the Freddy that pop culture remembers more so than the Freddy of the first movie. And what happened with Freddy Krueger in pop culture is actually very similar to what happened with Godzilla. The original Godzilla is actually a very dark film, and in that original film, Godzilla is an allegory for atomic destruction, but as the sequels went along, the films got progressively sillier and sillier until by the 1970s, Godzilla became an outright superhero. And unfortunately, it's the superhero Godzilla Godzilla of the 1970s that pop culture remembers more so than the Godzilla of the original film. The same thing happened with the Rambo franchise. People forget that the first Rambo movie, First Blood, and the book that it was based on is actually more of a drama and is actually sort of a condemnation of war, but by the time we got to the Rambo sequels, Rambo became this stereotypical action movie hero, and the films got progressively more jingoistic. Now, in the film, Tuesday Night replaces Patricia Arquette as the character of Kristen Parker. Now, I have nothing against Tuesday Night, and she's fine in the movie, but as mean as this is gonna sound, she's no Patricia Arquette. 
At the same time, I don't know how much of that is her so much as it is some of the dialogue that they have Kristen saying in the movie is pretty bad. At the same time, Tuesday Night does play this character so differently than Patricia Arquette did that if it wasn't for the fact that they make direct references to the previous film, I could honestly see some people mistaking this for a different character. And you have Roddy Eastman and Ken Sagos coming back as Joey and Kincaid. And even though I like the movie, probably my biggest problem with the film is the fact that they kill these characters that we've grown to care about so much in the previous film. They kill them off so unceremoniously and so quickly in this film. And on one level, you could say that that raises the stakes that anybody can be killed. But on another level, it kind of makes everything that these characters struggled for in the previous film feel kind of worthless. And if they had to kill these characters off, they really should have done it later on in the film and made their deaths feel a little more meaningful. But I also understand that they did it to sort of move the plot along and have the plot really focus on Alice and her friends. It also pisses me off that they killed Kincaid first. Kincaid was my favorite character in the previous film, and this movie also adds to that whole stereotype of the black guy always dying first in a horror film, which which for the most part is not as true as people say it is. Like, I can maybe count on one hand the amount of horror films I've seen where that's actually happened. Unfortunately, this is one of those horror films where that actually does happen. But in speaking of Kincaid, I had actually just recently met Ken Seiko's at a convention this past Friday. He was very nice, although I didn't really speak to him long. I just said I hated how they killed you off in part four, which I'm sure he's heard a billion times already. But the highlight of this movie is definitely Lisa Wilcox as Alice. Alice is my second favorite protagonist in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, next to Nancy. And I love her transformation in the film from this very shy, timid girl to, honestly, a freaking badass who you could totally buy as somebody who could stand up to Freddy. In the film, you also have Andrus Jones as Rick, Alice's brother and Kristen's boyfriend. You also have Danny Hassel as Dan Jordan, who ends up being Alice's love interest in the film. You also have Brooke Weiss as Debbie, who, spoiler, has probably the film's most iconic death scene, where Freddy turns her into a giant cockroach. And you have Toy Newkirk as Sheila. You also have Nicholas Mele as Alice and Rick's father, who is such an abusive prick in this movie. Although he does have kind of a redemption towards the end of the film, and especially in the next film. And you have Brooke Bundy reprising her role as Kristen's mother from the previous film, and I really do wish this and Dream Warriors would have explored this character a little bit more, considering she's supposed to be one of the people who killed Freddy, yet it doesn't seem to get talked about that much. Now, I can't really show a still from this scene because it involves nudity, but Linnea Quigley, who most people might recognize from Return of the Living Dead, she actually has a cameo in this movie as one of the souls of Freddy's victims that you see at the end of the film. And Robert Shea, the producer of these movies, has a cameo in the film as a teacher. Now, Robert Shea also had a cameo as a bartender at a gay bar in the second movie, and in my personal headcanon, I would like to think of these as the same character, that maybe bartending is this teacher's side gig. But yeah, I like A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. I'm not going to pretend that it's a flawless film or that it's a masterpiece by any means, but I do enjoy it a lot, and again, it's a movie that really has grown on me over the years. Again, I think the film has a lot of imagination. I think it's a very well-made film. I also think the film is visually very interesting. Like, I really love the set design in the movie, and they do a really good job at making the stuff that's set in the dream world really feel otherworldly and surreal. 
I also love how you can clearly tell this movie was influenced by Asian cinema. There's a Chinese film called The Chinese Ghost Story, which I think was a big influence on this movie. And for a horror comedy, there are some surprising moments of character drama in this. For example, there's a scene shortly after Kristen is killed where Alice is watching home movies of Kristen, and then her brother Rick comes in and starts watching them with her, and it's actually a pretty sad and emotional moment in the film, and it's actually more emotional than this movie actually deserves. Now, like I said, this was the one that really introduced the pop culture of Freddy, and while critically the film did get mixed reviews, this was commercially the most successful film in the franchise for the longest time. And it's nowhere near as good as the first three films, but I do like it for what it is. Now, I mentioned in my review of the first movie that it seems like the recent film Terrifier 2 was definitely influenced by Nightmare on Elm Street, but I actually think Terrifier 2 was also very much influenced by this one. Because Terrifier 2 also dealt with the main character being granted supernatural powers by some higher force that she doesn't fully understand, and the main character in that movie basically became a superhero, very similar to what Alice becomes at the end of this movie, and I would not be surprised at all if Damien Leone was inspired by Nightmare 4 in some way. Now, before I end this video, I want to cut to the segment of the retrospective on this franchise that I did with my friends back in 2018, where we talked about this movie. Now let's move on to A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, which is really the movie that I think really made Freddy Krueger the pop culture icon that we now think of him as. I'll admit, I did not like this when I first saw it. Over the years, this movie has really grown on me, and I honestly really do love this film. Now, I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the first three films, but I do think there's a lot of imagination to this. But in this one, Freddy is not scary at all. This is... I don't even really consider this one to be horror. To me, this is more of an action fantasy movie with some comedy drama elements, but I don't really consider it to be full-fledged horror. But what do you guys think of Nightmare 4? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I also think this is where the formula really sort of became set in stone. Um, it was, I remember seeing it in the movie theaters and just being not very um, impressed with the film. Uh, in rewatching it, um, I think my appreciation has gone up a little bit, but still, I, it, it doesn't, it's, I think it pales significantly next to the first three. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely pales in comparison to the last three, uh, especially the first one. Yeah, this is definitely where, you know, in part three, they, as I said, they had a healthy balance of humor and horror. In this one, the humor just starts to completely take over, and the balance is just... And the humor's not that funny. That's the thing, too. I mean, if you're going to do humor... Make it clever. It's not even that clever. It's like I, so on the nose. It's I, so dead on. Yeah, yeah but I, I kind of find it to be funny. For some reason, I've always found Rick's death to be hilarious, where he's like, Ninja warriors need no eyes. Yeah, he was originally supposed to just die in the elevator. Yeah. yeah, they. I don't think, yeah, but they were running out of money for the effect for that, so then they just came up with you know, that mm. whole dojo thing at the last minute. What I like about this movie, though, is I do like the characters, even though they are a little cliched at this point. Like, you have the jock, you have the nerd, but I still, I love Alice in the movie. I thought Alice was a great character, and I do like the characters, even though they are a little stereotypical. I still like them, and I cared about them. I didn't want to see them get killed, but what do you guys think of the characters? I, 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 see, I think they're total cliches, stereotypes. Okay. I, just, I was, like, not interested at all, where you have something like like in the first film, where you have, you know, you actually care about those the, the, the characters. They're much more realistic to me. They're much more um, uh, likable in that first film than in this film. Like, I just was waiting for them to die, you know, in this film. I have kind of grew up on this movie. Like, I saw it first when I was, like, 14, and I've watched it multiple times. I think the characters just sort of grew on me. Mm -hmm. And maybe I look for more depth in the characters than there actually is. Like, maybe I'm just reading into it more than there actually is. But I, I do think it's a very well-made movie. Like, Rennie Harlan does a fantastic mm -hmm. job in this movie. I love some of the sets in the movie. Like, they really do a good job at making the stuff that takes place in the dream world really look surreal. But yeah, what do you I mean, think of that? Rennie Harlan, I think, did a very good job directing it, especially given that, you know, he was under a lot of pressure. 
He was afraid that any day Bob Shea was going to fire him. He was really tried as hard as he could to get this job because at the time he had almost no money. I think he said he was living in some rundown place eating beans out of a can and he had to wear like the same clothes all the time, mm -hmm. you know. So he, yeah, he didn't take no for an answer. He just kept go showing up at the New Line Cinema offices, and they eventually said, you know what, he seems to have a lot of stamina, you know, that yeah. he could get this movie done, so they hired him. What, what do you guys think of the uh, recasting of Kristen? Because in the movie, Kristen comes back, but instead of being played by Patricia Arquette, she's played by Tuesday Night. What do you mm. think of the recasting of I Kristen? Mean, Tuesday Night does an all right job, but at the same time, it just would have been so great if they could have gotten yeah. Patricia Arquette. I think back. I think Patricia Arquette's a very underrated actress too. Yeah, you know, I, I liked her in some like True Romance, and she's I, I think she's a very underrated actress. So that's that is disappointing that she didn't yeah. come back. Yeah, and also I mean, both Rodney Eastman and Ken Sagos, I believe, both said that it was hard for them to convey the emotions for their characters to be you know interacting with Kristen again because it just wasn't the same as when they were acting with Patricia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and what did you think of them killing all the dream warriors off before you introduced the new set of characters? I mean, it's a shame that they had to do that. It's yeah. like, you know, you brought them all back just to kill them off at the very beginning. And I mean, if they had to do that, couldn't they have at least done it like midway or uh, yep. towards the end of the movie rather than just killing them off right at the beginning? Like mm -hmm. sort of how they, they handle it with Nancy, even though I was sorry that they to see her go. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do want to point out there is a reference to Nancy in the film because... Uh, Right after Kristen gets killed, you see her grave, and it's right next to Nancy's, Nancy Thompson's grave and uh, Donald Thompson's grave as well. I mean, I was sorry to see both those characters get killed off in part three. Yeah. They were great characters to watch. Yeah. Once again, I, I still really like the film. I, I do love the soundtrack for this movie. Yeah. I, for some reason, that little montage in the middle when Rick is doing his kung fu training and they play the song <laughs> Anything Anything, I thought was really funny. I, once again, I do enjoy the film quite a bit. It's clear I probably enjoy it a little more than you guys do, though. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit, like I said before, you know, they the series was always creative, and there are some good creative death scenes in this, like, you know, Joey's death with the naked woman in his water bed. Yeah. Yeah. I want to point out, the character of Joey, his weakness is definitely, you know, beautiful women, as we also saw in the third <laughs> film when he gets seduced by the nurse, which was really Freddy. Yeah. It's like, dude, you know, when you see that... You know, don't give into it. Run away. Yeah, really. Like, yeah, you should have learned that from the like, previous time. Yeah, it's like yeah, right. It's like you know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. Nope. Fool, fool me once, shame, shame on you. Fool, fool me fool twice, twice, shame on me. On me. Yeah. <laughs> now, was this around the time? I don't know if you guys know, but there was a um, the, the, there's the Fat Boy song. Are you ready for Freddy? That music video was definitely taken off of this movie. Right, right, right. Yeah. I remember the I remember seeing the record. It looked cool. The record looked cool. <laughs> Freddy, Freddy, Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> that, that music video is hilarious. It is. Though. It's awesome. Yeah, the Fat Boys and are awesome. Totally the, underrated. Around the same time, there was also the Freddy's Nightmare TV series, yep. which yep. Uh, I, I've i only seen like one or two episodes of it. I remember it being pretty poorly made. It was. I yeah. think there was only maybe, well, there was that one episode where you found out like it was like, you found out more backstory about Freddy. Yeah. One or two episodes or something like that. I don't yeah. know if it was a two-parter. Freddy was usually like the Rod Serling. Right, series. exactly. He but there was usually involved. But there was, yeah, there was maybe one or two episodes where he was, I, yeah. I, I could have sworn watching it. I remember seeing it at the time. Yeah, it became, it was like an anthology show. Yeah. It was kind of like a, you there know. There were a few episodes that involved him, but right. most of the times he was just, you know, the narrator. The exactly, beginning, yeah. Beginning and, ending. and the stories weren't very good. Yeah. And, but I think that all really came from this movie. I think mm -hmm. Nightmare 4, this is where Freddy became the pop icon. Right. This is where, like, you look at Freddy, like, he's almost like Mickey Mouse in right. a way. Yeah. And well, you know, it's funny. I think this is one of the first, it, well, maybe, I guess you could correct Universal Horror, because they mer merchandised Universal Horror stuff. Yeah. But it wasn't, I don't think they merchandised it at the time when those Universal movies came out. It was afterwards. But I think I'm wondering if this is one of the first horror movies in which merchandising was contemporary can you know was was uh, contemporary with the actual film coming out because i remember there was freddy dolls it was this really cool one where it was like it was like a, it was like a big doll and it like yeah. you could change his clothes and his face and everything like that but um i'm wondering if, if this was the first horror movie that really had extensive uh, merchandising i mean it yeah I, I do agree where it was definitely the one that really started to show freddy as a pop culture icon i mean i believe robert england said that when they were filming the beach scene you know they were in his trailer and he was i think they were done for the day the makeup artist was taking his makeup off, and this horde of fans was just pounding on the trailer. Mm. <laughs> and then even after he kind of tried to appease them by coming out, signing autographs, you know, they even followed him on his way home, like they were chasing him along the highway. Oh, okay. Another creative death scene was, of course, the, uh, I think, Debbie's death scene, where yeah. she gets turned into a cockroach. Mm -hmm. I think, as someone who is 
afraid of bugs. That one really got to me. I mean, especially the way they did it. Oh, I forgot to bring up uh, the special effects in this movie were done by Screaming Mad George, who I think is a great effects artist. He also did the effects work for the movie Society. I don't know if you ever saw that I movie. Saw that the one. Brian Dozen movie? Yeah. yeah, that's a great movie, but yeah, the effects work in this movie is amazing, especially Freddy's death at the end, where the souls yeah. of his victims start tearing out of him. Yeah, and I mean... I just, you know, seeing the uh, cockroach arms coming out of her, you know, ripped off arms, it's terrifying. Then when she accidentally trips and falls into that, you know, goo and it tears off her face yeah, and you yeah. see the cockroach underneath, it's horrific. And I just love when Freddy just, it re it's revealed he's holding the cock the roach motel and he's like, they check in, but they don't check out. And then crushes it and you see <laughs> yeah. the goo. Yeah, which was, out. that was a, po at the time, it was a popular um, advertising. I don't know if it was like Black Flag or one of the bug... Um, you know, one of the bug spray uh, companies. They that's how they advertised the the Roach yeah. Motels or whatever. And yeah. so it was yeah, a this, it was a reference to yeah, that. Of course, this is also the movie where his puns really started to get out of control. Especially like you know after he sucks the life out of Sheila, he's just. You that. flunked. Yeah, you flunked. Yeah, yeah that's that right. terrible. Do you want to suck the face? No. <laughs> want to suck face? No. <laughs> yeah, it's disgusting. Time for a spin, lovebirds. <laughs> Welcome to Wonderland, Alice. That actually worked. Yeah. That actually worked because her name's Alice, and mm -hmm. it's like, it's the a dream world. Yeah. Like, that yeah, okay. worked. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. That one was good. I also like... But you see Freddy doing Kung Fu at the end. It's like... Yeah, yeah. yeah it's I mean, awful. It's, yeah. it's cheesy, but once again, this is a movie that's grown on me, and I do enjoy the film a lot. It's still entertaining to watch, and I do love his line, How sweet. Fresh meat. Yeah, that's a good line. I thought that it, was a big. That was. I, mean, I remember in the commercials on TV and things. That was like a big. That was a big. Uh, you know, yeah, catchphrase for the for the movie. Yeah. Alice is a great character. I think. Here is Mark Allen Gunnell's review of A Nightmare on Elm Street Four. Now, Part Four, The Dream Master. That was the first film I ever saw in the theater when I was younger, and because of that, it holds a special place in my heart. But I'm not really a fan of that one anymore. Um, I think it's when the series really started to take a nosedive. Um, the basic story of Freddy trying to get revenge on the children of the people who murdered him, that got lost. Um, we started to go off in a different direction. The characters were a little more goofy and stereotypical to me. Um, and the humor, that's when Freddy really started just to become like a one-liner jokester kind of character. Wasn't a big fan of that shift. There's still some great set pieces in that movie. Um, the overall story is still interesting. I just don't think it's particularly well made. And it, it to me, it. I think the director, Rennie Harlan, had been in music videos previously, and I think that shows. And it seems a little too bright, too energetic. It loses some of the atmosphere that I think made the earlier ones work. Here is Chris's review of A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. So Dream Master is definitely the one that I can take or leave, honestly. Uh, I feel like a lot of people probably assumed that I'd say Dream Child or something like that. But this one, um, I mean, Rennie Harlan's directing. You're going to get something worthwhile to watch no matter what, especially with the Junkyard sequence. That's a lot of fun. Um, one of the downsides is we lose Patricia as, um, I forget what her character name is. Kristen. Kristen, there we go. Uh, yeah, we lose her, which which sucks. Tuesday does a decent job replacing her, but it, it does suck that we lose Patricia. Um, yeah, th th that's that's the thing about this one is that there's not much that sticks out of my mind uh, outside that. Um, yeah, it's de it's definitely the one that I could take or leave out of all of them. And here's John's review of A Nightmare on Elm Street for The Dream Master. For I have mixed feelings about because... There, there are some things I did like and some things I didn't like. Like, for instance, I, I didn't like how they killed off some of the characters in the first film. And also how Tuesday night, she was okay, but I, I liked Patricia Arquette. But again, she didn't come back in this film because she was pregnant. Understandable. I wish they, what they had done is like they should have like, kept the, the characters from the third film alive a li little bit longer until the end. Then Freddy kills, and that would have worked out a little bit better for me. But that's just a personal opinion. And... Lisa Wilcox, I, I, I have to say, she was a really uh, fun, cool character. In some ways, like, you could, like, relate to this character. You feel like you were, like, this person in high school. You were, like, shy and, you know, like... And also, I find it interesting... I thought it was interesting how, like, when the the, the, the people that she knew, her friends, after one by one kept dying, she kept, like, inheriting their, like, uh, like their 
Well, what, what would you say she was inherited? Like their, well, one, their dream powers, and also some aspects of their personality. Right, right, right. Like, I thought it was funny how, like, when she talks to one of her friends and she smokes, she goes, I don't smoke. Because she's, like, figuring out, like, wondering, like, why am I, like, you know, acting like this all of a sudden? And then until later, later she realizes, oh, it's because every time Freddy kills somebody, I keep inheriting their powers and their dream powers. Oh, yeah, I, I liked uh, the brother. The brother was actually pretty cool because he did karate in the basement because I used to do karate all the time. And also when the, the girl... What, what was that girl's name who bench press? Who... Debbie. Debbie. She, oh, when I see a girl bench press, sounds good to me. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you enjoyed this video overall. That was my review of A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, and my next movie review will be on A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child.